Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of our Flipped Classroom. And we're going to tap the brakes a little bit today. And instead of jumping into a completely brand new topic, we're just going to pause and, and go over an old AP question that I thought uh, really addresses some of the things we've we've seen recently. And if you go back to the beginning of this chapter of series, and we, we kind of painted that picture of climbing Mount Everest, uh, we are extremely close to the top of that mountain. And uh, it's been quite the climb, and we, we've really done a really good job. I can't say enough good things about uh, how we've done over the past month and a half. And uh, as you start to see the top of the mountain and, and can see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, e even my dog Bailey's pumped up. You can see here in this picture, he's pretty excited and uh, I'm sure you're feeling uh, some of the same celebratory emotions. But uh, So we're going to go through this problem here and, and one of the things I want to focus on on Sometimes these free response questions can be really overwhelming and intimidating and one of the things I want to focus on today is just being able to stay really organized and being able to break our work into smaller, more manageable pieces. And we'll talk about how the nine points were divvied up and, and exactly what we have to show to make sure that we get ourselves nine out of nine points. Par day is typically a nice warm-up piece and this one is no exception. Um, they were very, very friendly to us, and they gave us right in here the expansion with the first four terms and the general term for a certain natural log function. And then they talked about this f function up here, which is a close relative of this one down here. In fact, my game plan is to substitute an x cubed in for each of the x's that I see in the original problem. And all we had to do to know that was you'll notice, uh, you know, if uh, you see the correlation right there between the x and the x cubed. So, so as I build this, I'm going to say that f of x is x cubed minus x to the 6 over 2. And that's what you get after you take x cubed and you square it. Notice I'm not really not showing a ton of work here, and that's okay. Now I'm going to take x cubed and I'm going to raise it to the third power, which gives me x to the ninth over 3 minus x to the 12th over 4. I've got my dot, dot, dot. Uh, let's see if I can squeeze this in. Negative 1 to the n plus 1, x raised to the 3n. Again, just multiplying those exponents. And then don't forget your plus dot, dot, dot at the end there to show that it goes on. Remember, this equal sign right here and the dot, dot, dot that we throw at the end, those are married together. They go hand in hand. And probably if I had to emphasize one thing here, it's that as you substitute the x cubed in for like the x squared and x cubed and x to the fourth, we are multiplying those exponents as we move along. As far as the rubric goes, they're going to give you two points for part A. Basically, they're going to give you um, one point for having these four non-zero terms and then another point for having the correct nth term. And that's the premium they're going to put on that. Okay, I thought B was an interesting question. They threw me, uh, they caught me off guard by giving us the radius of convergence. Usually they ask us to go find it. Uh, so they saved us a little bit of time and effort um, so we didn't have to use the ratio test. And uh, also what I did is I kind of condensed my answer from part A. Uh, one thing, notice we didn't use the sigma earlier because we were expanding it. But then once you condense it, we will indeed throw the sigma on there on the nth term. Uh, but if we had the sigma on the last page, it would have been wrong just because you don't want it in the middle of that expansion. The other thing I didn't put was the where the n starts. Sometimes I we get into a hurry and we just assume n starts at zero. Well, you think backwards, like what would you have to substitute for n in order to produce the first term in your answer in part a? And I think you're going to have to substitute a one. So here's a situation where n should start at one. Once on a blue moon, you'll even see a series where n has to start at two or something like that. So by looking at this series, specifically right here, you can definitively say that this series is centered at zero. We're getting pretty good at that. And then they told us that the radius of convergence is a one. So I'm thinking my potential, potential, emphasis on the word potential, interval of convergence is negative one to positive one. And now I just need to check these endpoints. Um, the only time you don't need to check the endpoints is if it was geometric, but this one certainly is not geometric, unfortunately. So anyway, here it goes. Here's the left endpoint. Um, I'm going to say f of negative 1, which equals the series, uh, negative 1 to the n plus 1, and then that's going to be now negative 1 to the 3n, and that entire thing is being divided by n. Now, since we have like bases, we can go ahead and combine those two terms in the numerator 
and simply add those exponents together, which would give me 4n plus 1 all over n. Now here's kind of a fun tidbit. Uh, 4 times any integer is guaranteed to be even. Okay, just like 2 times any integer is going to be even. If you then take that even number and add 1, you're now guaranteed to be odd. So the argument that I'm trying to make is that my numerator is locked in at negative 1. Okay, um, so what's happening here? Is this an alternating harmonic? And the answer to that is no. All this is, it's a negated harmonic. Um, basically, the harmonic itself diverges, and then we're negating that, so you still have a divergent answer, just like the regular harmonic. So the left endpoint diverges. Now let's analyze the right-handed endpoint. We're going to say f of 1 equals, we've got our series, we've got negative 1 to the n plus 1, and then we've got 1 to the 3n uh, all over n. Now 1 to the 3n is always guaranteed to be 1, so really all I have in my numerator is that negative 1 part. This here, ladies and gentlemen, is the alternating harmonic. And anytime you have an alternating series where the terms are decreasing in absolute value, you're going to have a convergent series. So as a final answer here for part B, I'm going to say negative 1 is open, but the positive 1 is closed. Or similarly speaking, we could say something like this. That's an equivalent expression that would also receive full credit. Now, part C is where all the points are hiding on this particular problem, and you could uh, you really have to stay organized uh, as you attack this problem because there's really three different phases to this one. And what I did here is I just copied down our original answer to part A that described uh, the function f of x. The first thing they want me to do is to find f prime of t squared. So think of that as two steps. We're going to find f prime of x first, and then we're going to substitute t squared into each term. So going nice and, and deliberate here, uh, the derivative is going to be 3x squared minus 6x to the 5th all over 2 plus 9x to the 8th all over 3 minus 12x to the 11th over 4. You notice these derivatives aren't that bad. Um, we just have to be very organized. Now when you get to this term, remember, treat all the n's as if they were constants. And then we're going to say times 3n whoops, n, times x to the 3n minus 1 power, all over n itself. Those n's conveniently cancel out. Okay, now we need to substitute a t squared in for every single term. And I'm going to start to clean up those coefficients just because I can't help but do so. The first term is going to be 3t to the fourth. Multiplying those exponents again, which was the concept we emphasized in part A, minus 3t to the 10th plus 3t to the 16th minus 3t to the 22nd power. And actually, I don't think they wanted the nth term, did they? I almost went too far. They said find the first four non-zero terms for f prime of t squared, but they never say anything about the nth term. So, and if I did go too far, they're going to mark off right there. So I better stop, tap the brakes, and I'm going to put a box around this expression right here. That's my first official answer, my first official order of business. Now we're going to switch gears. We're going to start to focus on g of x now. And again, they want the first two non-zero terms. So we're going to say g of x is really the integral from 0 to x, and then I'm going to grab these first two terms and bring them down, substitute here, 3t to the 4th minus 3t to the 10th. All right, I'll throw a little dt at the end there, and we're ready to integrate. So let's say that g of x is really 3t to the 5th divided by 5, minus 3t to the 11th divided by 11. Just some very simple power rule. First fundamental theorem says we still have these bounds dangling there, which then becomes 3x to the 5th over 5. So all, all I'm doing right now is I'm substituting the upper bound in for t. Okay, and then minus the lower bound, but I think you can see without me showing you that substituting the zero in just gives you a bunch of zeros and that becomes irrelevant. So right here are the first two terms for g of x. 
And then, last but not least, they wanted me to approximate g of 1. And we'll say that g of 1 is approximately, let's see, 3 fifths minus 3 elevenths. Got some common denominators here, so I went with like 33 over 55 minus 15 over 55. Let's see, for a final answer of 18 over 55. One little itty bitty point I want to make before I go any further. I want to go back and tweak um, a little bit here. I got I lost track of my equal sign. Now up here the equal sign was was legit, and up here I should say, because I had the, the the nth term and I had those dot dot dots at the end. Now once I dropped the nth term and the dot dot dot, I should have switched gears into an approximation sign. Same thing here with g. G is an approximation sign because I cut off you know the uh, a bunch of terms. I only have a finite number of terms. Same thing here. Let's go with an approximation sign. Um, and then we do have the approximation down here in green. So just a little itty uh, bit to talk about. So uh, three parts down, one part to go. Okay, part D. They said that uh, this Maclaurin series G evaluated at 1, which is what we did back there in C, is a convergent alternating series with individual terms that decrease in absolute value to 0. Now that may sound rather strange, and, and we've never worded it quite like that. But remember, we said... We, in order to prove that an alternating series conversion, we'll just recall the alternating series test here, we said that the limit as n approached infinity of the absolute value of a sub n had to be equal to zero. And basically, if that was true, the alternating series would converge. Basically, that's what they're saying up here in that sentence. They're just putting it into words, and they're saying that the individual terms decrease in absolute value all the way to zero. Now, we're going to show that our approximation that we got, remember when we substituted that 1 in there, we got something like 18 uh, 50 fifths, something like that. We should have an approximation there. Okay. Now, we're supposed to show that our approximation is different. Now, when they say must differ, I'm thinking of the word error. All right? I'm thinking of the word error. from the actual value of g of 1 by less than 1 fifth. We're going to show that our error is smaller than 1 fifth. Now, if it wasn't an alternating series, we'd have to go use this crazy thing, Lagrange, and we kind of meant, we threw that term out there in Good Morning Math the other day. Uh, but we haven't talked about that topic yet, and with good reason. But uh, anyway, as long as it's an alternating series, we're going to focus on the first omitted term. So let's just get this into our notebook here, that the maximum error of an alternating series is less than or equal to the first omitted term. Okay, uh, This is such a cool principle, I can't stress it enough. It's less than or equal to the first omitted term. So I always think of that first omitted term as the worst case scenario. I know that it'll never really be worse than that. So we have to kind of go back to part C and look at because we used the first two terms for g, so go back and look at to see what the third term was, the third term. For instance, if you went back and looked at f prime of t squared, that third term was 3x to the 16th. And then if we integrated that, or I think it was like 3t to the 16th, but it doesn't really matter. Anyway, the th if once we integrated that, f prime of t squared, we would have gotten... Let's see, what would that have been? That would have been 3t to the 17th over 17. So this is what I consider the first omitted term because I used these two terms to generate my approximation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate that term at 1, which turns out to be 3 17ths, and compare that to 1 5th. Now keep in mind, 1 5th is the same thing as 3 15ths, if you compare the denominators, the bigger denominators on the left, so that means the bigger fractions on the right. And once you make this statement right here, we have successfully proved that our approximation for g of 1 is within one-fifth of the real answer. So there's a pretty neat free response question. There's a lot, a lot of little things going on around there. Um, I would, we'll definitely try this, a question, this question later on in the year as we get closer to May 8th and, and try to peak just in time for the exam. So hopefully that made some sense. Don't be afraid to replay it. Um, I wouldn't hesitate to maybe cover up all this work and try that problem again on your own at some point. 
and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.